Thank you very much, Ed, and hello, everybody. I'm uh, very happy to be here. I missed a couple of meetings because I've been traveling. I actually just came back from Sweden, and uh, but I'm happy to be here now. And indeed, uh, David, yesterday for the arts group, uh, was talking about the evolution of art, uh, which is a very important, very interesting talk topic about how you can study uh, how art evolves and how it evolves by means of natural selection and in cultural evolution in general. And um, I'm going to give a complimentary talk to that and look into how art has helped advance thinking, uh, human thinking, and also thinking on evolution. So there are going to be a lot of uh, different levels uh, here. And so we're basically going to look into uh, an example and we're going to look into how art has helped to depict aspects of life and of, of the evolution of life and how uh, then these depictions evolve over time. And so this then for me is also something that links to cognitive evolution. And then of course, it's going to be a uh, part of, of uh, the, 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 the group for evolutionary philosophy. And so um, we're going to look into the artwork um, that, that is relevant in a way for evolutionary philosophy as well. So uh, as you know, in philosophy, the major themes there are always like, you know, what is time? What is the nature of matter? What is the nature of space? And so this feeds into the study of cosmologies. And so I define cosmologies as worldviews on the nature of matter, space, and time. And what has happened over the course of natural history, um, uh, when you look into human evolution, then you see that these cosmologies evolve um, and, and you can study that from an cultural evolution. And you can study that through the forms of art that they have associated with and that they have brought forth. And so in that regard, cosmology is always associated with cosmographies and cosmographies are major diagrams that depict the basic ideas of a certain cosmology. And so we're going to look into Western cosmologies because I'm, I'm not an expert on on Asian cosmologies or anything, so I am not able to do that. But so we're just going to focus on Western cosmologies. And uh, here we can distinguish between four major cosmologies and these have transitioned over time and they have evolved from one another. And so the first one is uh, the cosmology of the ancient Greeks. And that is something that roots back all the way to the Neolithic, to the origin of uh, agricultural societies. And typical diagrams there uh, are wheels of time and chains of being. And so an example of that, for example, is the Zodiac. We're going to look into that. Another cosmology then is the cosmology of the Romans and the Judeo-Christians. And these are going to change these wheels of time and these chains of being into scales of nature. And these scales of nature are going to change into chronologies and pedigrees. And then what happens with the rise of classical physics and natural history with the origin of scientific thinking, that uh, these diagrams then are going to change into timelines and into phylogenetic trees. And then today, these phylogenetic trees are being changed again, and they are being changed for networks. And so we're going to break this down now. We're going to look into all of these uh, individually, and we're going to look into the different kinds of artwork that uh, have been introduced. And from the, 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 the three elements that define a cosmology, matter, space, and time, we're going to look especially into how these diagrams define time. And that then on another meta level, I think is something that is uh, 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 typical for, uh, it, it, it provides evidence of a cognitive evolution in, in, in humankind, I think. Uh, and so that is one of the things that I, I research, I investigate how these cosmologies depict time and how then that associates with causality. Now, I'm not going to talk that much about causality today, but so these wheels of time, for example, they adhere to a, a circular notion of time. The Romans and the Judeo Christians, they introduce a linear notion of time. Classical physics and natural history research in the introduction of evolutionary uh, trees introduce a multilinear notion of time and modern physics and evolutionary biology um, today question the existence of time. And if time is real, then they say that it is multidirectional. Um, and so we are going to look now into some of these diagrams that, that uh, depict these um, ideas. 
So typical for ancient Greeks is that they reason in wheels of time or what they call a chain of being. And so an example of that is the zodiac. So what you see here are different depictions of the Western zodiac, the tropical zodiac. And we find evidence for the, 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 the rise of zodiacal thinking already in Sumerian and Mesopotamian uh, religious, re religions. For example, also in the, the works of the Enuma Elish, there is reference being made to, to a certain zodiac. Also in Egyptian um, uh, mythologies, uh, there is mention of a zodiac. And what you have here, for example, is a depiction of the Dendra zodiac. Uh, here you have a depiction of the tropical zodiac uh, from uh, Tunisia, and here you have one as how it was depicted within um, uh, Judaism. This is a, a, a depiction of the zodiac from um, Israel. And so typical there is that this zodiac is a way in which humans start to conceptualize time because the origin of the zodiac associates with knowledge of seasonality and it associates with knowledge of the weather. And because of that, it enables also the rise of agriculture because for, for good agriculture, you, you need to have a good knowledge of, of, of uh, the weather, otherwise you cannot uh, have successful farming. And so um, you, you find this, this origin of the zodiac, and this is something that has been depicted uh, immensely in an enormous amount of, of uh, artwork. And with that, there is also an idea of a circular notion of time, because once a year has ended, it will start to new. Once spring has uh, gone over to summer and fall and winter, you go back to spring. So you always have a cyclical notion of time. And then what happens with the introduction of the Judeo-Christian cosmology is that this circular notion of time is going to become linearized. And one of the reasons that it is linearized is because scholars are going to start to add numbers to the years. So so you had the yearly cycle and that one returned. But what happens with the introduction of the Julian calendar and later of the Gregorian calendar is that scholars are going to start to number the years. And so year one follows year two, is followed by year two, by year three, by year four. And that gives the idea that you do not have the return of the same year, but that you have a new year that lies ahead and that lies in the future. And that then brings forth uh, a linearization of time. Now, um, the first evidence of, of a linearization we find in these scales of nature. So the wheels of time and the chains of being are going to be uh, reorganized into scales of nature. And what happens is that these original scales of nature are atemporal in a way. Um, so they depict eternity. So Aristotle, for example, in one of his works he in, uh, in the history of animals, he describes a chain of being. And so he says that all life forms are, are, are um, uh, uh, part of a chain that goes from um, uh, entities with no soul to entities with a vegetative and animalistic and an intellectual soul. And this idea of this chain of being um, was also something that was used to describe the zodiac. The zodiac, for example, was a belt of animals and it was literally in these ancient texts sometimes called a chain of animals. And so this chain then becomes linearized uh, in Judeo-Christian tradition. And so what you have here, for example, is a depiction and interpretation uh, of uh, Alonso de Prozoa of the 15th century already of a work uh, much earlier in time written by Ramon Lul in, in the 12th century. And so what you have here is this, 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 this beautiful uh, <laughs> chain of being in a way where you have these, these um, scales of, of, of nature. So um, according to Ramon Lul, for example, he said that you have uh, a stairway to heaven and at the bottom you have inanimate matter that is followed by fire, by uh, plants, animals, humans, angels, and then you have God in heaven. And so this brings forth a linearization and this brings forth the idea that there is a great chain of being. Here on the right, for example, you see uh, the image uh, typical of the... Um, Rhetorica Christiana, where you have uh, also this chain. And here you have, for example, God um, that stands on top of creation. And then he chains mother nature who then changed the elements uh, on, on the chain. And then here, for example, you have some fallen angels. And here you have the devil. This is already uh, very much inspired by, by Muslim culture. You have here the devil uh, at the bottom of this chain. 
Now, what is typical here is that these chains depict an eternal um, order, an eternal, what is thought to be divine order of the world. And in that regard, it is atemporal. But what happens then in natural history research is that exactly these chains are going to form the basis for uh, the scales of nature and the scales of natural history. So people are going to add time to that and they're going to look for the existence of this chain in nature. And that is actually what then brings forth evolutionary research. So let's look into uh, the rise of uh, classical physics. So here, for example, what you have uh, already on the left is um, a timeline. So um, what you have here, for example, is, is the, the geological timeline, uh, time scale. And in that geological time scale, then scholars are going to look for, uh, they're, they're going to match evolution in there. So for example, here you have the, the geological time scale, right? And the geological time scale is a very um, data-driven scale of deep time. It is uh, that moment in time when scholars start to realize that the earth is much older than was uh, predicted in, 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 in uh, the works such as the Bible. The Bible said that the, the earth was only 6,000 years old um, based upon cal calculations of, of the generations of the individuals mentioned in there. But then uh, natural history research uh, proves that the earth is much older uh than was thought but originally scholars did not know what the numbers of the the earth were what they did know was that there were different layers of the earth and these different layers um first were a numerical and they were also non-uniform so for example what you see here is this geological time scale and you see that certain of these periods are uh larger uh, uh, or wider, I, I'm not sure how to say it in English, but they, they are larger and others are smaller. And that is because these layers in nature are also fatter or thinner uh, as they uh, uh, exist in, in the Earth's crust. And these then, um, this idea then later becomes numerized. And then what you have here, like you see it here on the right, uh, which is a, a small part and an expansion of this scale, is that here also there is a uniformization and that is there because of the introduction of uh, a numerical timeline. And then what happens is that these numerical timelines become uh, the means to measure evolution and to measure the evolution of species. And that then is something that is depicted into evolutionary trees, because here you see that an evolutionary lineage does not only uh, uh, follow one another. So one species does not only evolve out of existence into another species. Sometimes species also split off from other species. And with that, it brings forth an idea of the, sorry, of the multilinearity of time. And so, uh, of course, one of the first to introduce that idea was uh, Charles Darwin. And here uh, you have his famous, I think, diagram, where he uh, also, without adding time, uh, thinks that this is how species diversify from one another. And then in his book on the origin of species, uh, he has this diagram, uh, which is not a tree of life. It is for him a hypothetical diagram of how species might diverge, how they might speciate over time. And so what you have here is this, this, this speciation uh, uh, process that he saw. And what he does here is he adds a uh, timeline, one based upon uh, letters, still not on numbers, but each letter here for him represents 10,000 generations. And it is then for him uh, over time that there will be uh, speciation and diversification of the original lineages. And that then is for him what defines um, the origin and diversification of species. Now today in uh, modern physics and in modern evolutionary biology, the tree of life, um, is uh, also under attack because it is not able to depict processes, for example, of lateral gene transfer 
or of symbiosis. And um, in general, scholars are also not only interested anymore in depicting the natural history uh, uh, of uh, a species, they also want to investigate how uh, species, for example, interact with one another in the ecology of nature. And when they try to depict that, then they depict that into networks. So what you have is you have a, a general tendency to, to, to go from timelines and trees to uh, rooted and unrooted networks. And one of the things that I find very interesting there, interesting there is that if you look into these networks, that what happens there is that time disappears. And this is exactly also the discussion that uh, uh, modern physics has. The question is whether or not time is real. And if it is real, at this moment in time, scholars are very unable to add time to these networks. They don't know how to do it. It is very difficult to do it because of the multidirectionality that is involved with these um, uh, uh, phenomena that they study. So this is one of the challenges. Scholars are actively investigating that right now. How do you add time to networks uh, to depict um, evolution? And so in that regard, you have these different uh, scientific um, illustrations. I've been talking now for, for 19 minutes. I can, I can talk for another 10 minutes or I can, I can end it here. What, what would you prefer? I think keep going. Yeah, I've been finding okay. this fascinating. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so then on a, on a different level, so I'm studying these diagrams, right? One of the questions then that I raise is how, um, so these diagrams, these, these are major um, cosmographies, right? But today we don't really use the term cosmographies. Uh, we are not like, um, uh, if you are a scientist or a philosopher of science, you're not like trying to find this one image that explains the entire universe anymore. But what scholars continue to do and what is a direct outgrowth of these cosmographies is scholars continue to think about hierarchies. And hierarchies are very important to depict units and levels of evolution, for example. And so in that regard, uh, what you see here is a, a distinction that I make between different kinds of hierarchies. And so um, these timelines, for example, is what I call a linear hierarchy. So linear hierarchy is a serial or a sequential successive or consecutive arrangement of units in time. So basically, when you look into a timeline, you make a line, you go from the Big Bang to the present, and you have different chunks of time, and that provides a linearization. Now, this linearization is very problematic because it often underlies false reasoning. And I know that Marsha in the beginning, for example, was saying about um, uh, how can we uh, 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 fight eugenics, for example, and, and, and all of that. Well, one of the things that has happened is because of this linear notion of time is that uh, uh, scholars started to draw evolution as a march of progress. And uh, David was talking about that yesterday uh, in his talk as well. And so the idea is that if you uh, look, for example, into the geological strata, and if you just depict how species arise there, you get this linear chain. And also today, for example, if you start digging and you find fossils of hominins, for example, Neanderthals will precede us in time. And in ancient times, scholars would, would think, ah, okay, so Neanderthals are our direct ancestors, but we now know because of tree of life typology, etc that Neanderthals are not our direct ancestors. They are our cousins. They are split from another, uh, from, from a common lineage. And so we, we have a common root, but both of us follow different trajectories and, and you need to think about that in terms of a tree. And so um, in general, linear ideas of time bring forth problems such as the march of progress, which is often uh, 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 based on false reasoning. But the reason that it is based upon false reasoning is because scholars taught, in, taught time in linear terms, and that is something that uh, is wrong. Another thing that is happening a lot today is that scholars think in terms of nested hierarchies. Um, uh, when scholars uh, investigate how species uh, diversify, for example, then uh, the lineages that they depict basically depict species that are made up of organisms that are made up of genes. And so what you have is a nested hierarchy. And so uh, these nested hierarchies, they define what um, uh, in causation is defined as upward and downward causation. So um, when you say that genes constitute organisms and that organisms constitute species, you develop a nested hierarchy. 
And uh, in terms of causation, you assume that the lower level brings forth the, the focal level and that that brings forth the upper level. And then you are doing natural history research and you're looking into affordances, how genes afford the evolution of organisms, how organisms afford the evolution of species. <coughs> Now, there are a lot of debates these days going on on the existence of downward causation. In downward causation, scholars investigate how species might influence how organisms evolve or how organisms might influence how genes evolve. Um, and that is research that looks into ontogeny and into ecology, um, that looks into epigenetics, for example, how the current environment can impact how uh, genes evolve. And that is something that uh, demonstrates downward causation. But here too, this idea of nestedness is, is uh, uh, not sufficient to capture the complexity of nature. Because as an individual organism, especially if you're a sexually reproducing organism, um, you are much more than the sum of your own genes, you are also uh, a combination of, you are, you are a combination, for example, of the genes of your mother and the genes of your father, plus the genes that were acquired uh, many billions of years ago, um, the, the organelles that are part of your cells. And so um, this might be more counterintuitive, but this idea of a nested hierarchy is in and of itself only one part of the picture and it is not sufficient. Um, and this is because of reticulate evolution. So because of processes such as hybridization or lateral gene transfer or uh, symbiogenesis, we know that different lineages can exchange uh, information. They can exchange genes uh, between one another. So for example, the sexually reproducing organism is uh, the child of the, the mother and the father. So that are two, uh, lineages that come together and that then bring forth uh, an individual. Also uh, during hybridization, for example, we know that different lineages can, can cross. Also during lateral gene transfer, when you acquire the flu, for example, what happens is that a virus transmits its genes into uh, uh, your gene, to, towards you and into your genome. And so you have different lineages there. And when you try to depict that, then you get again these uh, networks and you get also kind of what I call uh, reticulate causation. And so that is where um, these networks come in. And so I define these as interactional hierarchies that look into multi-directional reticulate interactions between units belonging to different levels of the same or different hierarchies. And so that then brings forth reticulate causation. So the basic uh, take home message of that is that there can also be uh, reticulate interactions between different hierarchies. And so in conclusion, uh, we can say that there is the evolution of art and also that art uh, itself evolves. Art enables us to think on worldviews, on cosmographies and cosmologies. And art in that regard influences science and science influences art. And what I think that we see here is really a cognitive evolution of us as a species, a cultural evolution of us as a species of learning to, to, to capture the, the, the fundamentals of time, of space, of, of life. And uh, as such, it demonstrates a form of cultural and cognitive uh, uh, evolution. And in that regard, of course, uh, it's very important to choose the right images and to convey the right messages, especially when you look into scientific illustrations of evolution. And so with that, I thank you very much and I look forward to your questions.